could you please just let me know whether you can see my screen? No, yes. Yes, all right. So hello everyone. Thanks for the nice introduction, Hurley. Uh, it's actually gonna be quite hard to, to follow the previous presentation. Very, very well done, I really enjoyed it. So my name is Merim Jafaregic and uh, I'm a Connect researcher. I work as a postdoc at the Connect Research Center and the Trinity College Dublin. Uh, the title of today's presentation is the impact of missing data on the fault detection and classification in an industrial IoT system. So we will talk about the motivation behind the work that, that we are doing right now. I'm going to be presenting a part of the, the work that we just submitted to the IoT journal. And uh, I, I hope that, that you will enjoy that. I'm also going to try to, to get some feedback from, from the community to see what you think about certain, certain issues. So let's just move a little bit away from all the problems that we are facing every day and just look at the, the ideal world. So whenever we talk about an industrial setting, we kind of uh, start from the approach of, uh, of a control system engineer where we kind of have all those small robots, all those small components working together, very well synchronized and everything works perfectly fine together. So we basically just do some kind of overview of what's happening in the system and we hope that everything's gonna be fine. But in this ideal world, uh, everything would work perfectly. There would be no need to, to monitor the production uh, process and there would be no need to monitor the state of the machines. I know this is super, super idealistic. That's why I said we're going to the, to the ideal world. Well, uh, the real world is, is not, uh, not really like that. And we're facing quite a lot of different issues. There are different uh, problems related to, to faulty elements, uh, uh, simply elements breaking, as, as we would sometimes expect if we're talking about spindle or we're talking about any kind of machine that's cutting through metal or wood or anything else. We can actually talk about uh, problems with the physical components themselves. Uh, as uh, Stefano mentioned in the, in the previous presentation, we can also talk about uh, issues related to, to some unexpected events happening, like uh, a human being entering the factory. And uh, we would have some uh, human interference when it comes to the, to the operation of the, of the whole system. We can also talk about uh, the faulty communication devices. So if two devices, like if the operation of two devices is related to each other they have to work in perfect sync and uh, they usually kind of move along uh, along a production line and uh, there could be different problems with the production line itself so everything could be synchronized the machines could work perfectly but if the production line is not perfectly synchronized we can face other types of problems so how do we deal with those problems so whenever a problem arises we would have a maintenance engineer let's say go in there and try to figure out okay What's the problem? Why did the problem arise? And uh, when and how did the problem arise? So what we're trying to figure out is like how to do proper maintenance. There's a lot of parts in, in such a complex system and all these parts have to work nicely together. Sometimes, yes, we can talk about a broken part, but uh, we could actually, if we try to, to understand the root cause of the problem, the broken part uh, probably broke because, I don't know, material was used up or the part broke because the temperature went up. Well, but then if we start digging deeper, so this is like the five why questions, uh, we basically dig deeper and we try to figure out, okay, why did the temperature rise or why did we use up a certain material? Maybe the production line is too fast or maybe we don't have enough time to, to cool the system down. So if we try to kind of go back further and further back, it actually becomes quite complex to understand the, the relationship between all those parts. And there must be a better way. And obviously, as we all obviously uh, agree here in, in this consortium, there is a better way and it's the smart world. So we started from the ideal world, we went to reality, and now we're moving forward with the reality. We're pushing it forward with the smart world. And uh, the smart world is an idea of an, uh, let's call it an IoT factory. So uh, <laughs> please don't think that I created all these graphics I, I took them from different websites and i have references at the, at the very end because i don't want to plagiarize anyone's uh, figures so we're talking about a smart iot uh, iot factory so what's happening here we still have the robots we still have humans moving around the factory but what we do now is we have a sensor network deployed and the sensor network collects data so that we can uh, have advanced analytics so based on a lot of different measurements they can be re measurements related to one uh, one machine or multiple machines connected to each other. We do some kind of data acquisition and fusion, and we kind of try to put together all, all these raw data. 
to process them and create advanced analytics. From this advanced analytics, as uh, we've also already heard from our partners from, uh, from SET, we can actually understand quite a lot about, about the operation of the whole system. We can even make predictions uh, by ourselves about what's going to happen in the near future with certain parts of the production line. However, as humans, we're not as perfect and it's sometimes very hard to put together all these raw data sets to have a much deeper understanding of what's going on and when things are going to happen. So, so far we talked about what happened and why it happened. However, there's this third component and it's when it happened. This third component is actually quite important, the component of time, because sometimes we want to understand when something happened, like, and what happened before that event, and what do we assume is gonna happen next? And uh, these, this part, what's gonna happen next, the near future, is something that's very uncertain and something very hard to predict. And uh, obviously it's not just hard to predict in an IoT factory. It's, uh, I'm really sorry, there's another phone. Uh, going on over here. So uh, as I said, it's sometimes not just hard to predict um, in, in an IoT factory, it's very hard to predict in any communication system. And with machine learning, we very often try to make those uh, short-term and sometimes even long-term prediction of what's gonna happen next. However, let's, let's take a step back. And even though we all love the idea of an IoT factory, but there's a problem with this smart world as well. And that problem is actually related to, to a lot of the parts of this smart factory. What we did here is we went from us uh, doing the maintenance of the whole system, us following the, the work uh, of all the machines, and uh, we kind of moved it towards a higher level, level where we said, okay, instead of us trying to figure out what's gonna happen, let's just deploy all these sensors to collect a lot of data. And then we can actually have a high level overview of uh, what's going on in the factory, which is great. But what happened now is we have a lot of these sensors. We have a network that's layered on top of the system. So we have a system on top of a system. And now instead of doing the maintenance of, uh, of the system itself, of the factory itself, we have to do maintenance of uh, uh, the IoT network itself. So it's, it's like, I don't know, having a babysitter to take care of your baby because you don't have the time, but then the, the, the babysitter is too young, so we have to take care of the babysitter. So it kind of just, it's, it's kind of a chain reaction over here. So different things can happen. Like we could have different problems with the, the hardware itself. So sensors breaking, we could have problems with, uh, with the communication between these, these sensors and the problems with acquiring data from, from these sensors. It could be a human moving around and just basically producing different types of blockage. So uh, losing data in the communication. It could be a problem with, uh, with the way we store data, or it could even be a problem with the way we create these advanced analytics, which very often could result in us not actually having a good understanding of what's happening under the hood. So to make sure that all these things happen, we apply different different techniques, right? So one solution would be, okay, we said devices could break, sensors do break. So we could have some node redundancy. So instead of uh, going with the Boeing approach and just having one sensor to measure something, we can actually have multiple sensors measuring the same thing, which is very often quite, quite useful. Uh, we can even have a communication redundancy, like in terms of multiple communication or even different mediums uh, being used to, to communicate, like we could have wired connections or uh, even increase the, the node complexity. However, these solutions sometimes are quite useful and uh, we, we can implement them, but very often, for example, we can't have wires in, uh, in the system because we already have, let's say a factory and it's very hard to deploy sensors that would have a wired connection to it. Sometimes it's, uh, it's not feasible to, uh, to basically apply multiple sensors at one single machine just because of the space not being there for it. And uh, there's a lot of other drawbacks related to increased cost. As I said, uh, certain solutions not being feasible, uh, nodes not being reliable by itself because, well, they're never 100% reliable. And there are also power outages that we can hardly predict. So we can actually uh, see two types of problems. So right now I'm trying to, to focus the, 
the attention towards something that we tried to analyze. And it's actually related to these uh, techniques of gathering data and making sense of this data. So when we're gathering data, we can actually actually uh, face two, two types of problems, like short-term outages that could be uh, caused by humans, uh, human interference, short-term communication issues, short-term sensor outages. And uh, we, could, we could also talk about long-term outages, like a physical sensor failing, like a sensor simply breaking because, uh, I don't know, it fell off of a machine that, that moved around. Then we, we can even have long-term communication issues, for example, because of a relocation of the space inside of the factory, and then suddenly the communication is not reliable anymore. So how to deal with those issues? Yes, one, one way would be to go back and redesign the system, redeploy the network, et cetera, but then things like this, especially uh, not, not just in factories, but also in, in big storehouses can actually be uh, very difficult to deal with because the, the topology would be as dynamical as the system is. So one approach to deal with the missing data from one or multiple sensors is an approach. And obviously that's not something new to, to I, I guess, all of you because you've heard about data imputation. And like, obviously if, you, if you've looked into anything related to statistics and gathering any kind of data set, you've, you've heard of the concept of, of data imputation. For some of you that might not have heard of the concept, it's basically the process of replacing missing data with uh, substituted values. Okay, so there are multiple ways and multiple techniques to perform that. One approach is uh, called, called the hot tech approach. That's probably the, the oldest technique. So we basically just gather a data set and then if we have missing values, so I don't know if it was a survey and we're missing a couple of answers in that survey, we, we're just gonna replace those answers with the most common used answer from the samples that look alike. Then there's a callback where we use multiple, multiple data sets. Then the mean substitute, we just substitute the missing value with the mean of all the other uh, values used for that feature. Then imputation using the most frequent values. So we just choose the most frequent values and replace all the missing values for a specific feature with the most frequent ones. And then there are different regression uh, techniques. So we focused on a regression technique that's based on machine learning. And in our case, we used uh, generative adversarial networks, so GANs. And uh, just for, for some of you that might not be familiar with the concept, so uh, a GAN is basically a set of two neural networks that basically help each other to get trained to perform a specific task. So we have a generator that's gonna be used for the regression itself. And then we have a discriminator. And we train both networks sequentially. So we first train the discriminator. So the discriminator is there to is basically a classifier that distinguishes between uh, fake and real data. So if we take a sample from the data set, we feed it to the discriminator, the discriminator should say, yes, this is a real sample from the data set. If we give it, if we just generate, if we do use any kind of data imputation technique, the discriminator should be smart enough to say, uh, this looks like a real sample, but I don't really think that this is a real sample. So it's trying not to get fooled. Whereas the generator uh, is basically being trained to fool the discriminator. So the discriminator would have one cost function, which basically we are just trying to optimize and to minimize the probability of uh, falsely classifying uh, any, any data sample. Whereas the generator is trying to create a fake data sample that basically follows the same distribution as the data set itself. So it's basically trying to fool the discriminator. And they're basically playing this game uh, where the, the generator's cost function basically has two parts. One part is related to minimizing the root mean square error of uh, like if you compare the output and the input of the generator. So you feed the generator with, in our case, with a data set with missing values. And then you're trying to generate the full, uh, full sample at the output, and then we feed that to the discriminator, and then we hope that the discriminator, a good discriminator, is going to say this is a real uh, a real data sample. Well, if the discriminator is really really good, the discriminator is going to understand that this was generated by somebody else, and it's going to say this is not a real sample. And then we feed back this uh, response from the discriminator to the generator as part as part of, of its cost function, basically optimize this generator to fool the disk. 
And this is, uh, in general, if you look at it uh, from, from the data imputation point of view, it's actually a really good approach to do data imputation. And you can get samples like then after we, we train the network, we can basically just cut off the discriminator and just use the generator to generate, let's call them fake samples or imputed samples. So we have missing data and uh, we, we feed it as, a, as the input. I don't know, the, the feature two is missing. And then the output of the generator is gonna be all the features plus the imputed feature two. And um, it's, it's actually quite good if, you, if we minimize the root mean square error and we have a really good discriminator that helped us to, to train it, we can actually get very, very good with it. And then if you look at the statistics of the data set, it's actually gonna look like a complete data set, which is great. But let's think back, what was the whole point of doing data imputation in our industrial IoT system? Well, we wanted to have this smart factory where if a problem occurs, the problem might not be a, of a physical nature. It might not be, it might, something might not be broken, but if it was a paint shop, maybe something is wrong with the way we painted a component. And then we want to, we, this is obviously a failure in the system. So we want to be able to detect those failures and we want to be able to classify them. We want to be able to understand what kind of failure it is. So instead of just having the, the data imputation bit, we have to think about the, the, uh, about the anomaly detection and the fault classification part. So uh, we tried to train a, a gun to basically do data imputation for us. And we had our issues. I'm gonna talk about those issues later on. We managed to solve some of those issues. And then we created a data set that actually looked like very, very similar to the original one. However, it was not performing very well in terms of uh, fault detection and classification. Obviously it's always gonna depend on the, on the techniques to use for fault classification and uh, anomaly detection. So for anomaly detection, we, we chose to use uh, an autoencoder. I'm not gonna get deeper into autoencoders in this talk because we, we don't have enough time. And for classification, we just use a, a neural network. So we realized that uh, the imputed data set was not performing very well on, uh, on persistent sensor failures uh, when we tried to, to detect anomalies and to classify them. So we basically then created this system model architecture that basically allowed us, we, we first took the training data set, we train a gun. And then once we have a, a, a generator that's good enough, uh, we basically uh, take the validation data set and the output of the gun is used to basically do anomaly detection and classification. And then we take those validation results and we feed them back to tune the hyperparameters of our gun again. And this was kind of an iterative process until we got a system uh, that was robust enough and that was good enough. And the reason for this kind of connection between the data imputation module and the modules for anomaly detection and, uh, and fault classification, uh, the relationship is actually quite important because we do imputation for anomaly detection. We do imputation for fault uh, classification. We don't do them just for the sake of having a nice looking uh, from the statistical point of view, nice looking data set. So then we basically uh, tested the, the whole system uh, for multiple scenarios. So obviously the, the most basic one is we collect a data set from multiple sensors. By the way, we used the Tennessee Eastman process, the extended Tennessee Eastman process data set to, uh, to, to train the network and to, uh, to test everything. Uh, and uh, so the, the easiest approach is, okay, we take a data sample for the normal operation, we send it to the fault detection, the fault detection module, there is no data missing. The fault detection module just says, okay, there is no faults. So there is no anomalies in here. Okay, that's fine. The next scenario would be, we take a sample from a faulty scenario and then the anomaly detection uh, module tells us, okay, there's an anomaly in here. And that's when we send this sample to the full classification system, which is basically gonna tell us, okay, this is fault one, this is fault three, et cetera. Uh, the third case would be when we have missing data. So we take a sample from the missing, uh, from the data set and we introduce missing data. And then we do data imputation and then send it to the fault detection. And it tells us, okay, there is no fault in here. And it's, it's apparently true. And then the, the last one would be when we send it to the full classification model, the imputed data set, and it tells us, okay, there's an anomaly in here. 
and then we try to classify it. So for different types of faults in the system, for example, um, if we if we looked at um, uh, at uh, random faults, completely random faults of, of sensors. So in each time step, a sensor just stops working for a very short short time. Uh, we actually realized that we don't even need a sophisticated data imputation techniques technique. It's enough to use uh, simply the average. So if you use the average and a sensor that does not persistently fail, a sensor just fails at random, you're actually going to perform very well just by assuming that the new value is equal to the previous value or that the new value is equal to the average of the previous 10 values. So you can use a moving average. Uh, however, we realize that this technique is not good enough if uh, we have persistent sensor failures. For example, if a sensor breaks and we can't uh, hope anymore that we're going to receive any, uh, any sensor measurements uh, in the near future. In that case, if we just try to kind of replicate the previous value all the time, we're going to have a huge, huge misdetection rate and uh, a huge false alarm rate. And in that case, uh, data imputation by using a more sophisticated imputation technique, uh, as in, in our example, uh, we used a, a gun, uh, is actually way more useful. So what's next? So the next the next thing would be to, to replace our Tennessee Eastman process data set with a real data set that we hope to get from, from SEAT. Uh, another thing would be to test the, the impact of noise on the learning rate of the gun. That's something that we realized uh, the gun actually has a problem with. If you have noisy data, the generators get sometimes very confused with between distinguishing different types of, of samples. And then instead of using uh, permanent or missing completely at random data, we would like to fit a distribution to a real data set to model missing data. However, the last question that, uh, that Pedro mentioned, and we're trying to, to do anomaly detection here, uh, since we're talking about anomalies and we're talking about rare events, it's actually very hard to collect a data set that looks like that. Even with the Tennessee Eastman process where we had a huge data set with the extended one, we had a huge data set with a lot of anomalies. Uh, still, if you compare the number of, uh, of samples related to the normal operation to, uh, to all of the anomalies. So if you look at only two states, you look at normal operation and uh, faulty operation, then it's fine. But if you look at faulty operation one, faulty operation two separately, you have a very small subset of uh, faulty operation one as compared, compared to the overall system. And sometimes the learning uh, approaches actually get biased towards, towards the larger bit of the data set. There are different techniques to, to get around around those things, oversampling, bootstrapping, et cetera. We, we've been dealing with them and uh, we managed to get, uh, to, to get a generator uh, good enough to train it for the Tennessee Eastman process, but it would be nice to see how everything would wor work on a, on a real world system. So thanks, uh, thanks for listening and uh, I'm, I'm open for questions right now. Thanks, Marian. So let's see who, who is the first one to ask. I, actually, there is a question in the chat. So Irfan, okay. would like to ask? How to address the problem of time dependence, time varying channel? I mean, how to show at what time the fault or failure occurred? Uh, do you mind turning on your mic just to, to explain the question a little bit, bit more to me? Hello? Uh, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes now I can yeah. hear you. I yes. mean, in this industrial IoT, uh, when like, uh, my, my point was like for machine learning, when we transfer the packets and the failure occurs, like how we can address to the machine learning, like he mentioned, like there are three expect we say like the failure, uh, at what time the failure occurs, how we can address through the machine learning. Okay, 
So uh, from, from what, what I understood, uh, it's like, okay, we want to know when the problem occurred. So the prob when the problem occurs, the system kind of stops working. So what we are trying to do with our technique is like, I mean, the end goal would be like, right now we're doing data imputation, but the end goal would be to do like predictive maintenance so that we kind of uh, predict something's gonna break very soon. But the, the question is actually really good and it, it relates to, to the uh, time in our algorithm. So in our case, we actually are dealing with time as well. So you, you could actually approach it with, uh, with a technique similar to, I don't know, LSTM, like uh, long short term memory, uh, which is uh, a good approach. I haven't been using it, to be honest with you. But what we've done, instead of using a data sample that has 52 inputs, we actually use these 52 inputs as an input to our, to our gun. And then we use uh, the delays, we call them delays. So we use this input and we kind of extend the sample with the previous input and the input before that one and before that one. And then uh, our network learns the correlation like over time as well. It learns the correlation between the current input and the previous, let's say 10 inputs. So that, that's, the way, that's the way we've been dealing with, uh, with the time in our, in our network. If you're asking about how to basically uh, understand when a problem occurred, I'm uh, not really sure that uh, you would uh, approach it with, uh, with a gun approach, let's say with an imputation approach. If you're trying to figure out when a problem occurred in the system, you would, uh, you would have to use different techniques to basically, uh, I don't know, even dynamical system techniques to basically just uh, backwards engineer what's been happening in the system. Okay, you had a, you had a problem and then you would go you would go back to see okay what caused this problem and then what caused this problem so i'm not really sure that you could approach it with with any of the techniques that that i've just been showing in the presentation okay okay thank you so much for the answer thank you thank you for the question i have one question myself so yes uh when you are doing your uh, fault uh, your your fault detection are you doing this kind of real time, right? Or are you looking the the whole data set and then okay, now this is a fault data set? Oh, How? that's that that's a good question. We we've been actually thinking about it, and we we're not doing it for the whole data set. So what we're doing, we're doing it for each sample uh, separately. So we basically uh, take a data set, and it's obviously divided into samples. I think it's three minute samples in the Tennessee data set. And then we, we go sample by sample. So we send a sample with missing data and then we impute that sample and then send that sample to the anomaly detection module, yep. which is basically gonna tell us this sample is faulty. And then yep. we send it, send it to, the, to the classification and we are trying to figure out what kind of fault it is. Uh, this is actually, I, I believe from, what, from the interaction I had with, uh, with you before, uh, this might be less efficient than the approach where you use the whole data set because then it's much easier to tell, okay, like I, I can see all the variations and the, uh, and the kind of, I, I zoom out and then I see that, that it's a faulty data set. But we are trying to do it sample by sample. Yeah, I, we, I, still, I, I, we still get to, to like 90 something percent accuracy, almost like 95% accuracy for all the faults. There are some faults that are very hard to detect though. Yeah, but I think, I think it is good because I can't, uh... I, I think that, that I think for, for the, the fault detection, I think this is the correct approach. And for the classification, then I think you can use like a, the full data set once like, a, you, but, but again, I think this is, the, the two approaches are actually uh, very yeah, different. Because we, we, yeah, because we tried, we tried to kind of simulate the, the real world behavior because you would not yeah. collect data for like, I don't know, two days and then try to figure out was there a problem in the system. You want to know the moment it happens. Yep, exactly. And yeah, uh, I, other I things like, a, yeah, and I, I guess that like, a, that then like, as you mentioned, next step would be uh, uh, the prediction. So you are knowing beforehand if a fault occurs and then you can mention it and then you can actually check if occurred or not. I think this is, as you exactly. Mentioned. That that would be the, the next big step, and that's yeah. uh, something that that we as a consortium plan for firemen, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Include the imputation parts. That okay, you miss data, and then you still can uh, run the the real time thing. So exactly, yeah. you can still yeah. predict whether something yeah. something bad is going to happen in the system. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree. I think that's very good. So, thanks, Merin.
So now, thank you. Yeah, Thanks, I everyone. can give the mic back to Hirley. Thank you, Pedro. And uh, next, uh, we have Adrian Gligor and Emil Gatiao. They will be talking about Zoom, social network of machines, a solution for a smart manufacturing. And uh, just a second. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Adrian here. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, this is a good opportunity uh, to, uh, to see the interesting uh, presentations. Uh, at this uh, uh, presentation that uh, uh, was prepared, uh, let's say in, uh, in the framework of our project, uh, the Zoom project, Social Network of Machines, uh, uh, this will be divided in uh, two parts. Uh, the first part will be presented by my colleague, uh, Emil, and uh, at the second part, uh, I will uh, continue the presentation uh, with uh, um, the topic uh, related. So, Emil, if you can hear us and if you can share uh, share the screen. Emil, can you hear us? Yeah, you cannot hear you, Emil. I think you just hear some some noise. Do you hear me? Yes, but a little bit with uh, low intensity. Ah, yeah. So I'll try to boost my mic. Okay, now it's okay. Now, now it's, it's okay. Good. That's great. I have a little bit of pro problem with uh, my mic, so I apologize. Okay, I'll try to share my screen. <laughs> 